minister here at Lindenwood Christian Church. If I haven't had a chance to meet you or greet you yet, I would love to say hello to you at the conclusion of our service. And just to reiterate what Cody said, hey, if you want to learn a little more about who we are and what we are about, stick around right after worship. Go out the door, turn right, find the coffee pots, enter by the door, and we would love to get a chance for you to have coffee with the ministers. Someone wanted margarita with the ministers, but it might be a little too early in the morning for that. But we welcome you, and we look forward to the chance to get to know you a little bit better. We are in the middle of a sermon series called You're Reading the Bible All Wrong, which is quite a statement, by the way, if you sit back and think about it. But what we are doing is looking through some familiar Bible verses in ways that we may want to reimagine how we understand them, or even let go of the way that we'd always been taught what they're about. What we want to look at today is the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 10 through 14. So at this time, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word as we listen for the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed... For Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and I will come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. You may be seated. We ran an ad in the weekly paper in a little town called Alito, Texas, town of about a thousand. We ran literally a classified ad that said, if you'd like to help start a new Christian church, we would love for you to show up next Sunday night at the Bearcat Cafe in downtown Alito. Now, downtown is a very relative term when your town has a thousand people. But at the Bearcat Cafe, we gathered 15 people that wanted to help us start a new Christian church in this tiny little railroad town that was growing into a booming suburb in West Fort Worth, Texas. Well, in this community where everyone was moving to, they all had two parents and 2.5 kids and three minivans and a house with a pool, and they began to make their way into the Bearcat Cafe, and it was target hit. We need a church that reaches young families that are moving in to this growing community. And then in walked Laverne. Laverne, well, by her name, you know she is not driving a minivan with 2.5 kids. Laverne was in her late 70s or early 80s at this time. She had lived in this community for almost all of her life. And she was not a big fan of all of these, quote, new people moving in with all their problems. But she came, and she wanted to help start a new Christian church. And she did. She was the kind of woman that would show up early and make the coffee. There's a special place in heaven for people that show up early and make the coffee. She would bring the casserole to the fellowship dinner. She would make sure that little children had a place to sit and be welcomed in the congregation. And Laverne took up her near apostolic calling to get this new church up off of the ground with few people and no money, and Laverne helped make it happen. Funny little side story. I asked her early on, why are you doing this at your age? I said it a little more pastoral than that. But why are you doing this? She said, Jeff, little church of Christ on the corner, that used to be a Christian church. And then they fired the pianist and went church of Christ. And the pianist was my aunt. 
And I've been waiting since the 40s for you all to come start a mute church that does things the right way. <laughs> I don't know if that's true theologically, but buddy, it made me laugh. It made me laugh. Christmas Eve, about our fourth year of being a church, Laverne called me. I knew she was supposed to help out at the 7 o'clock service, and she said, Jeff, I can't be there, and I need you to come over. And I went to her house. And she shared with me that she had cancer. And that it was bad. And there was not much treatment. But she wanted me to pray for her. And she wanted me to bring her communion as often as she could receive it. And so I went and I prayed. And our new elders in that church learned that being an elder was a lot more than setting up chairs and praying at the communion table, but sitting there with people as they prepare to let go of one life and grab a hold of another. And Laverne and I began a journey that took her life and crushed me. I have sat with people for 25 years in this calling, transitioning from one life to the next. I have sat with people that have gone through tragedy and loss that I can't put good words to. But I don't know if it was because I was young or because I thought I had all the answers, but what Laverne went through shattered everything I believed about God and suffering. Laverne went on and off hospice three times because for a lack of a better term, she couldn't die. But she continued to deteriorate. I sat with Laverne and she could not talk. But Laverne always had a lot to say. And there was a pain in her eye when she couldn't speak. Her body was broken. And her spirit was deteriorating. How could... This woman, late in life, who let go of all that she thought she knew to let little kids know how much Jesus loved them, go through all of this, one of the longest goodbyes and most painful goodbyes I have ever journeyed through. She finally, mercifully, passed away. And I didn't have any good answers why awful things happen to people of deep faith. Now, I have two degrees in theology, and if I can get my paper done next year, I'll have three soon. And after all that, I know less about suffering than I did when I started. Anybody relate to that? I can't be the only one that has struggled with this. A car wreck takes place. The drunk driver lives, and the family of four dies. Where is God in all of that? Can we ask that? Where is God in all of that? A tornado flattens a community in western Kentucky, and if it had gone one mile north, Houses and churches and schools and lives could have been spared. Where is God in all that? A 57-year-old woman who took great care of her health, who exercised consistently, who didn't put anything in her body that wasn't healthy, has a stroke at 57 that continues to diminish her capacities and has been reduced to a wheelchair with difficulty moving around. I don't have the faith my mom has. And I don't know where God is at in all of that. At some point, our confidence in the goodness of God collides with the reality of suffering. So let's take a deep breath of the weight of this moment 
and just admit together, we don't have all the answers, do we? No, we do not. One of my attempts in all these years of ministry is to avoid cliches, avoid them like the plague. That was a joke. (laughs) Avoid them. Don't lead on pat answers. Don't say everything is going to work out and God knows what he's doing. Don't ask questions. The Bible's full of people asking questions of God. Jesus asked questions of God on the cross. Surely we can ask questions of God in our suffering, correct? And when we bring that struggle, how do we put a faith back together? Now, as a minister, the go-to answer, where do we turn? The Bible. And we should. And we can think that we should turn to the book of Job, which is all about suffering that is unjust. We can look at the Apostle Paul that's writing letters from prison as he is treated unjustly. We can look at the ministry of Jesus where he dies on a cross and committed no sin and killed at the hands of a government and duplicitous people. Good places to start, but I want to turn somewhere else to a Bible verse that I think we treat like a band-aid on cancer, that I want us to reimagine. Jeremiah 29. Now, the prophet Jeremiah is one of these stereotypical prophets. The image I, I have of him is he looks like a professional wrestler. He's got long, straggly hair. He wanders through the city. You see him coming, and he's got his own music playing at the Mid-South Auditorium and Coliseum as he makes his way to the center of the city to unleash God's word on the people. I always think of the prophets and John the Baptist like Jerry the King Lawler. Can I get one amen to that? There's always a scene. And Jeremiah is no different. 626, before the birth of Christ, He lives through five kings. He lives through the reign and administration of five kings all the way up to 587 B.C. when the people of God, Israel, are scooped up and taken into exile in Babylon. So imagine everybody in Memphis is invaded by a foreign country. Let's call it Little Rock. And they come and they take us and they cart us off In this land that we deem holy, we can no longer gather in. The temple that we call worship has been crushed. That which is familiar, that which we think God requires of us to have, we can no longer do because we have been taken away as exiles to a land that is not our own, to live among customs that are not our own. I don't know if people in Babylon made them call the hogs, but that's what I have in my head of the vast change of culture that they had to experience. And so as those that are dealing with unimaginable loss, those that are trying to understand where is God at work in all of this suffering, we see these words in Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you. Not to harm you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you to give you a future and a hope. Doesn't faith do that for us? It gives us a future, and it gives us a hope. Google, which is the second best source for truth other than the Bible, right? Right under the comment section on the commercial appeal. Google says that this is one of the most searched Bible verses one of the most memorized Bible verses, one of the most commercialized Bible verses. You give a graduation card to someone and you're going to put Jeremiah 29, 11 on there. Young high school student, the Lord declares, I have plans for you. I know your future. I'm going to build you up and you're going to prosper. Wedding day, young couple comes together and a minister stands up and reads, I know the plans that I have for you. You. We go through trials, we go through tribulations, and we lift up Jeremiah 29 11 as the searchlight to find our way in a dark world. If I were to say it sarcastically, Jeremiah 29 11 is the most likely Bible verse to find on a pillow at Hobby Lobby. <laughs> Amen. 
But what? What if we're reading the Bible all wrong? We like Jeremiah 29, 11. But did you read Jeremiah 29, 10? I will restore you from captivity, says the Lord, after 70 years. 70 years. Now, I've reached this point where I know I've got more yesterdays than tomorrows, even at 46 and 11 months. I am aware of that. But what kind of promise is it that says after 70 years, I'm going to give you a future and I'm going to give you a hope? What kind of truth is it that says I know you're suffering and it's going to stay this way for a while? But can you trust me? when I do not immediately eradicate your suffering? Can you believe in a God of hope when you wake up to the same crisis over and over and over that is replaying like an episode of Saved by the Bell? Can you do that? You see, too often, we take strong Bible verses that in context reaffirm that life is complex and we reduce them to a meme as a detour around our suffering. Somewhere along the line, we came to believe that faith is an exemption from pain. Scripture does not give us that light. Amen. Faith is not an exemption from pain. Amen. When I was a little kid, I used to play... Monopoly. We got any Monopoly fans in here? All right, I like to know who the capitalists are. I'm cool with all that. I loved Monopoly when I was a kid. And if you got one of those cards from the center, you know what it was called? Get out of, frail, get out of jail free card. There was nothing better that when you had to go to jail that you could reach underneath the board, pull it out, slap it down, and say, I've got to get out of jail free card. Folks, I think sometimes we have taken Jeremiah 29, 11 and our bad interpretation of it and seen that trouble is coming our way, that suffering is coming our way, that injustice is coming our way, and we can pull out a Bible verse and say, there's nothing here, God's got me. God might have you and you might hurt. Amen. Both those things coexist in the story of God's people. We can be in all kinds of roller coaster of loss and cancer and emotional despair and brokenness and war, and God can still be God even if we have to walk through that ten times longer than we ever wanted to. Amen. There is a faith that is built going through the desert. There is a faith that is built in captivity that is stronger than a faith that sticks its head in the sand when you should be walking through the desert. God has a track record of using our suffering to deepen our faith like nothing else in this world will do. This is not permission to promote injustice. This is not the same as oppression but suffering for which there is no first mover. We are not immune to it. And faith is built stronger when you've gone through exile. Theologian David Ray says that faith grows deepest in two ways. Silence and suffering. Amen. Now we, will, we should choose silence. We should have more silence in our prayer life. We should have more silence in our worship life. But I don't know anybody that's signing up for a small group to enter into voluntary suffering. <laughs> it comes at us. It's inevitable. It's unavoidable. Some of us go through more than others. I cannot deny that. But suffering comes on all of us. So I am not telling you to stand up and applaud when suffering comes your way. But I am asking you to make space in your mind for the truth that God in God's mystery may somehow use this to make you into someone you would never have been if you had not gone through the exile. There is a power on the other side of our pain. And you have, I sound like a TV preacher here, but you've got to go through it to get to it. 
there is a faith that is deepened in our exile. Amen. Now, I've been here a little over three years now, and I've gotten to the point where I want to start repeating myself. So when I start repeating myself, you are free after worship, not during worship, to come and correct me. So I am going to repeat myself here in a cliff note version. The mentor of my faith more than anyone was my mom's mom, my grandma Leeson. My grandma Leeson was raised during the Depression. She had a father that died at a very young age. She had a brother that forged his age and lied to the government at age 14 to go join the army and be in World War II, and she thought he had died and didn't reconnect with him until years later. She had another brother that she did not know about that she was able to reconnect with only in her 20s. And then, God bless her, she married my grandpa, who I love, and he's gone on now, and he was not what we call a pillar of righteousness. <laughs> and so, when my mom was seven, my aunt was eight, and my uncle was six, my grandpa left them, mid-fifties. She raised three kids as a single mom with a husband that had abandoned them with a drinking problem and a gambling problem that made his drinking problem look like nothing. 20 years later, he calls her up and says, I'd like to reconnect with the kids. And she said, why don't you move back in? I never stopped loving you. Now, I know my grandma. There were more words than that. <laughs> but that was the arc of the story. And she brought him home and took care of him and nursed him until he died. People would always ask my grandmother, where did you get this faith? Where did you get this faith to raise three kids as a single mom in the 50s? Where did you get this faith to make it out of an orphanage and into a professional career as a psychiatric nurse where you were able to be at the pinnacle of, of your profession? How were you able to continue to have such a joyful spirit after all that Bill did to you? And how in the world did you take him back into your life after all of that? And she had a line that she would repeat over and over that is the opening line of the book, The Road Less Traveled, by Scott Peck. She paraphrased it always this way. Life is difficult, but once you accept that life is difficult, it's not so difficult anymore. Amen. I don't know if that's in the Bible. Call me a heretic. I think it should be. <laughs> life is difficult. We can pretend that it's not. We can be Pollyannic and pretend as if nothing bad is going on. We can use all of the religious jargon that we can to keep our pain at arm's length, but I'm here to tell you one truth, a one truth of Christian faith that cannot be refuted is that life is difficult. Amen. And then once you admit that life is difficult, it somehow is not so difficult anymore. You can have a plan of denial for your suffering or you can have a plan of acceptance for your suffering. I have wanted to invite you over this sermon series to read the Sermon on the Mountain. If you weren't here last week, as a church, we are reading through Matthew 5, 6, and 7 over and over again for these five weeks. It's a real easy way to get into the core teachings of Jesus, of what he says about life, what he says about God, what he says about us. If the Bible confuses you, read these three chapters. I guarantee you, it will startle you and it will comfort you all at the same time. In the Sermon on the Mountain, Jesus ends by telling a story of two builders, he says there's a wise builder and a foolish builder. Wise builder builds his house upon the rock. The rains come, the floods rise up, the winds blow and beat against that house, but that house does not fall because it's founded on the rock. The foolish builder builds his house on the sand. The same rain, the same floods, the same winds beat against that house, and that house crumbles because it was built on the sand. Now, I am not a meteorologist, but I think Jesus is telling us there is a 100% chance of rain. Suffering and pain are inevitable. The question is not how do you avoid it, but what do you build your life on? Because that will determine how you get through it. Amen. What have you built your life upon for the consistent storms of suffering that will come your way? 
I remember we were on vacation in Dayton, Ohio, if you want to know how exciting our family vacations were when I was a kid. But we were in Dayton, Ohio, and I got to go spend the day with my cool Uncle Phil. Uncle Phil had been in Vietnam, and he loved to tell war stories. Uncle Phil had been a drummer in a rock band in high school and right out of college, and we loved hearing him talk about rock and roll. And he would give us the Van Halen albums that my mom and dad wouldn't let us have. He was my favorite uncle. Remember a world where Van Halen was really edgy? Most, some of you don't because I'm old. But I remember a world where Van Halen was edgy. He was driving us across town to go to a record store where he was going to buy some new instruments and that he was going to let us each pick one record, my brother and I, and he would buy it for us. My heart was set on Iron Maiden like it was the gospel. I could not wait. As we're driving down the thoroughfare, my uncle leans over and says, put your seatbelt on. Well, I kind of hemmed and hawed, and I wanted to say you're not my mother. And I thought you were the cool uncle, and so he reminded me again. And then he reminded me again. And I finally relented when he said, I'm going to pull over if you don't do this. And so I put my seatbelt on, and we go racing down the four lane in Dayton, Ohio. And I kid you not, half a mile later, a woman runs a red light and T-bones us. Uncle Phil had his seatbelt on. Jarrett had his seatbelt on. And I'm glad I had my seatbelt on. How much good would that have seatbelt have done me after the wreck? <laughs> you got to have something you hold on to and that will hold on to you before the storm hits. We got to buckle up in the presence and the power of the gospel because we cannot predict what is coming next. So I want to encourage you to find some friends to live with that will support you through the storm. I want to encourage you to get some principles to live by in the Sermon on the Mount that will support you in the storm. And I want you to find a God to live for so that you have a purpose that is bigger than going about your lives and paying your bills. You see, I believe in a gospel that needs to look the world in the eye and tell the truth. And I think the catalyst for us To be a church on mission in this community is not to have a Pollyannic view of brokenness and suffering. You only need to walk out the door to see brokenness and suffering in this city. But that we tell the truth about what we are going through and how God will lead us through it. I want us to imagine if our church was a place where we embraced our pain and all that we were going through by not just telling the truth about God but telling the truth about ourselves. What would it do if our church was known as a place where people talked about their lives in an honest and unfiltered way? I want us to imagine what it would be if we were to open our hearts to Jesus and his love so that we could lean on him in our sorrow in a way that doesn't have to rush out and put our seatbelt on after the wreck comes our way. And I want us to imagine if the word on the street about our church was this, If your life is hard, join these people because they will tell the truth about how life is hard and that God, one way or another, will lead us out of exile. Even when it hurts, God is God. Even when we do not understand, God has a future for us. And even if it takes 70 years to journey out of exile, we have this hope in the depths of our soul that through the storms in the night, He will not let go of us. He will not let go of us. Because God knows the plans that He has for you to give you a future and a hope. And I am here to report what is true whether we like it or not. Nothing builds our faith like suffering. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Good and gracious God, each of us have a story to tell. 
all of us have journeyed through our own version of exile. It may not seem like much to others, but oh, have we hurt. So Lord, give us the courage to tell the story about the world, ourselves, and your love. And we know at the intersection of our sorrow and your promises, we can build a faith that is stronger than it was, stronger than we could ever imagine. So Lord, empower us to avoid all of the band-aid cliches that we stick on our pain. And let us tell the truth that exile is difficult, but that your love and your power are promise are stronger than anything that we go through. Because we know that in life and in death and in life after death, we are not alone because of the gospel of Christ Jesus. It is in his name we live and pray. Amen. If today is the day that you would like to take that next step in your faith journey, if today is the day that you would like to make Lindenwood Christian Church your church home, or if you would like to follow up on what it would mean to be baptized, at the end of our service, you can make your way to the double doors in the back. Mike Taylor, one of our elders, will be there to greet you and welcome you and walk you through a simple process of making this your church home. And for many others of you, I know you're going to join us for a cup of coffee here in just a moment. We'll have an opportunity for you to join our church at that gathering as well. But if you just have questions, make sure you make the most of that opportunity. At this time, we invite you to grab communion.